my goal is to form a liaison to, to hand over the mic from the founders of the internet to our next, thank you so much, uh, presentation about sustainability. I uh, should probably start a timer, or should I just watch for Arturo? Good, and my lens here is gonna be a historical one because I just finished this book project on the history of data, history and ethics of data, really. Um, and so I'm gonna try to take these 385 pages and turn them into four and a half minutes while we're together. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the internet, which has been great. Thank you very much for the internet. I use it all the time. <laughs> but I'm a big fan, um, as well as a thank you letter to um, the founders of the internet. So the internet was a huge success, right? So here's one graph from our world in data showing that you can see that different tech has taken off pretty well, including things like radio, and there's the internet in there, which um, has done pretty well. These data, of course, only start around the time of the web, not to be conflated with the internet, which was a huge product shift, right? It was a sweet product that introduced people to the internet and the many things it was capable of. How did the internet come to be? So we're here uh, in part celebrating one particular paper from 73, and as Vent mentioned, uh, it wasn't like there was no connectivity before that. Many people had been thinking about how to connect various places, and many of the places that were influential in creation of the internet are represented there in this early, um, you know, sort of baby picture of the internet, SRI, RAND, I'm sure, B yeah, BBN is there. There's a bunch of places that were contributors to what became the internet and also became a way of us understanding how we will interact with each other via inter information. So one of you made the point that it's not just about technology, it's about the way people interact with each other. And I think it's a fun thing to remember the original founding documents, even before 1973, that people were thinking about the internet as a technology that was gonna change the way we communicate with each other and, and collaborate with each other. Thank you very much. Totally fair. Uh, you're right, and as mentioned, right, the internet was called the internet because it's connecting different networks, right? And over, you know, 73 through 80, 71 through 83, a lot of the work, including work done by Vent and others, was just to get people to be able to email each other across different companies that had their own uh, different email protocols. Anywho, so I want to remind you that the internet is not just a piece of tech; it was a vision for how we were going to change the way we interact with each other. Licklider, who I know the founders of the internet worked closely with. Um, had a vision for it in 63, if you can believe people were writing about this idea as early as 63, and Licklider, of course, trained in physics, but also psychology, and he really had a vision that the internet was about the way we communicate with each other, about not just, um, I don't know, cat pictures and memes, but also the possibility that we would share resources, as mentioned, uh, but also be able to communicate with each other and collaborate with people in distant cities, which today is obvious, but in 63, that was a really inspiring vision, among many other visions from Licklider. Advancing onward, uh, this is a great picture which I'm proud to um, have found of uh, our, our, our keynote speakers from 50 years ago. This. Good. Had, had the desired effect. Um, there's Vent and Bob 50 years ago and one of the figures from this very short high level paper that really set out principles. As mentioned, right, the principles of TCP IP were done from the perspective of design principles, not a particular implementation or technology, which is one of the reasons it survived so well for 50 years. They are lauded not just for that paper, to be clear, but for decades of advocacy standards, galvanizing people, and also encouraging people to maintain that vision that the internet is not just about packets that manage to find their end destination, but is gonna change the way we do things like search. Here's a little article from your local newspaper in 1989 by Khan and Cerf are advocating that like, you know, the internet could give us a totally different way of searching for information, which as we know, it has. Yes, and it's very intimately to this conception of digital libraries, right? Li as you know, Lick was very involved in the digital library project when he, I'm not gonna switch, switch back, but to 63, he was working on totally changing the way we thought about libraries and accessing information and making usable, right? And if you go to the book, you can read about Memex and the ways that other people were thinking about technology and computers as changing the way we understand and organize the world's information, to use a modern phrase. It was also realized very early on that man, there was gonna be a lot of information and it was gonna be a deluge, right? IBM published a paper in 1958 by Loon advocating that we should create a new field called business intelligence Similarly, Herb Simon, who is a fellow laureate of the Turing Prize, also one of the, I think he's the only person to have a Turing Prize and a Nobel Prize in economics. I'm scared, I'm, I'm scared I'm running over time now. Anyway, so Simon warned us in 69 that we were gonna be running out of information. It'll be an information-rich world, and of course, when you have a, uh, so much information, it will consume the thing which is its opposite, which is our attention. 
That is, a lot of people realized in early days that one of the benefits of the internet was going to be an attention dearth. Uh, and, and brings us to today and that whole attention economy, uh, a phrase that was used much later. Um, it was also realized much later that the internet was not just about collaboration, it was also a new instrumentation device. Right? And particularly at Bell Labs and at t which is a place which if you read the history, you will see really was decades ahead of their time, right? the Google and Facebook of the day. John Chambers writes, many mundane commercial and social activities generate large quantities of potentially valuable data. Retail sales, billing, and inventory. The data were not generated for the purposes of learning. However, the potential for learning is great if we can cope with some major challenges. And you can look at the historical record and see that Bell Labs, at t uh, really brought about the future by dealing with those challenges of abundant data. So the internet is not just a collaboration tool, it is also a measuring instrument. I'm scared to look at Arturo to see how much over time I am. Good, um, which has brought us to our present day in which the internet helps us understand the whole world, right? It's not just a way for us sharing mega computers, which was also super cool, uh, but a way of really us understanding ourselves and the world around us. Which brings us to this graph, my final liaison graph. I'm, grad I'm glad that the uh, internet and its disparate um, usage across the planet was mentioned. This is a graph from 2016 from Our World and Data, a great place to go to for data. And you can see that the internet has done pretty well over the last couple of decades, but it's extremely heterogeneous in its adoption. The top green graph is North America. The blue graph down there is Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, we still have a lot of opportunities and challenges where I hope people remain hopeful. I hope also people remain Licklider's original vision of the internet from the 60s which is that it's not just gonna be about you know, getting all the world's information in the palm of your hand, admittedly, super cool, but it's gonna be about changing the way we access all of that information and collaborate with each other. And with that, I will hand over the floor to our next group um, of optimists. Thank you. Thank you.